backpack. Go, I'll just uh, introduce uh, next uh, Ben. I have not actually vomited in Ben's backpack, so that that, that, that <laughs> thing is. You missed that story? It, yeah, you did miss that story. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you can't walk out of here for a second, Ben. Um, <laughs> so. Um, uh, ben, you know, uh, many of us um, worked in Solaris kernel development at Sun Microsystems back in the day. Um, ben was actually the, 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 the guy we dealt with in the community. Ben was a, a leader of the Open Solaris community um, since we started Open Solaris. So, uh, and, and predates us all at Join. So it was great for us to be able to. to I win! Uh, exactly right. <laughs> yes. Ben wins. Anyway, uh, Ben Rockwood. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's been a wild ride, man. I mean, if, you, if you've if you dealt with Sun uh, back in the day or, or other companies, you know, and, and, and begging, you know, can you please finish this bug? I could really use that. I used to uh, email uh, Jerry Jelnick, and uh, particularly because he was doing zones and, and uh, all the guys in the crossbow team, and like asking, like, you know, hey, I could really use that feature, like, right now, if you could just finish that. Um, I think, uh, 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 what was it? It was the resource controls uh, that, that was added on the zones. I forget the name of the project, uh, but that one I actually like. I actually kept emailing Jerry so much that he actually pushed it for me before he went to lunch uh, because I needed it so bad. Um, and now he's on staff, which is just kind of wild, right? Now I can just like open a ticket for him uh, or take him on, and I am please do this. So it's been interesting. Um, so Ryan Nelson was going to do a talk in this slot uh, called uh, Smart OS by the Rack. Um, that could mean like four different things, and I'm not really sure what you meant. So I changed the title to Smart OS and SH Primer, uh, or Primer, depending on what school thought you come from. Um, this talk is intended to be a very quick kind of preview of what a day in the life of Smart OS administration looks like. I'm not going to explain everything or go into massive detail on every little concept, but most of you, I assume, know Solaris pretty well. If you're in Solaris 10, raise your hand. Oh, I'm gonna fall down. Everyone was supposed to raise their hand on that one. Okay, open Solaris. Oh. <laughs> HPUX. Oh. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure there weren't more than like five percent of the hands on that one. Um, wait, am I the HPUX meetup? <laughs> Uh, and who's actually run Smart OS? All of us. Cool, thank you. Um, so the thing is, is that because you already have a history with Solaris, and this is de this is descendant, albeit a, a far away from Solaris, when you start, you may start looking around for things that look familiar. And it's a very different platform. This platform is honed for a very specific purpose, and you may get a little lost, confused, and scared out there. So I want to kind of give you a lightning tour through what it looks like. So when you go and try it for yourself, which you're totally going to do tonight when you get home after you kiss your wife, um, you'll be like, oh, I just go right here and the docs will make sense and stuff, okay? This has been said before, but it is really, really important that you understand. SmartOS is a virtualization platform, what some people will call a hypervisor, although it's not technically a hypervisor. Um, it is a virtualization platform. It was built specifically for that purpose. If you don't understand that, you're going to walk off into dark, deep forest. Okay? Now, this is how I think of the Illumos landscape. Um, the really cool thing about Illumos is that, that, that's, that the Solaris was an amazing tool that can do a lot of different things in a lot of different arenas. And it was a little confusing when you had one mega tool that could be used to build a switch or build a virtualization system or build a NAS box or whatever. Now that we have specialized distributions of it, it makes life a little more rockable. So, the, in my opinion, the big three that descend from Illumos are Nixinda for storage, SmartOS for virtualization, and OmniOS as a general purpose server. If you are looking for an Illumos distribution that, that will mimic what you used to do with Solaris 10 and Open Solaris builds, and you want to be able to run like, you know, a honking database in the global zone, you don't want to use virtualization, don't do it on SmartOS, life is going to be scary, go with OmniOS. OmniOS is freaking awesome. I'm not just saying that because Theo is here. <laughs> because look at that logo. It's freaking awesome. <laughs> hey, um, wait a minute. You're dissing my logo. No, I lo no, 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 no. Awesome logo. See all the cool logos? We have a lot of cool logos, and I like ours the best, but it's a dragon. <laughs> <laughs> 
you, it's hard to beat dragon. <laughs> um, so down here, I put the 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 bastard uh, uh, distributions. <laughs> 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 Bellinix and Stormoaks. I hear that Bellinix is back from the grave. Um, I say the bastard uh, because, and I, I'll be, I've been very frank about this, all throughout my years uh, in Open Solaris and on the board, Solaris is, has been, and always will be a server operating system. You can put it on the desktop, but it kind of sucks. Um, those of us who, who have always loved Solaris as a desktop platform, loved it because we liked having the server on our desk. <laughs> right? <laughs> Not because of ran gnome. Um, that's why CDs are beautiful. So these are great platforms. A lot of people have done a lot of amazing things with Open Indiana, but not so great for it. He's one of these guys. And more are welcome. I'm not trying to polarize things. I just want to give you a sense. Um, so, design for virtualization, what does that mean? So one of the things here is, is like uh, Bill was talking about, lightweight deployment via USB or Pixie. We focus, we're going to focus on USB because Pixie is a little outside of this talk. Advantages of that, he listed a couple. Here's my list. Uh, no on-disk installation. So that's the, ooh, that's weird. Um, I had to be convinced of that. Um, it took a little while. Um, there's a great video where, where we go over the advantages of it. I had to be sold too. Um, uh, but there's no disk uh, wasted for the root disk. Particularly in a virtualized environment, this is really annoying. Once upon a time in the JPC when we were running Open Solaris, there were two disks set aside as root mirrors. And that's all they did. Um, and then the remainder of the disks were actually used for customer stuff. That was a lot of waste. It's completely useless. Um, this stuff never changed anyway, so we're not wasting disk. No patching. Patching is stupid. Um, <laughs> it's like Nirvana. It stays in the 90s. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to draw that out any further because it involves a shotgun. Um, fast and reliable upgrades. As we said, just reboot. That has a lot of advantages. Uh, enhanced security. What's a rootkit? Go for it, dude. Um, besides, it's read-only, so like, go ahead, put your binary in the user, not going to happen. Um, this is also useful for sysadmins who don't listen when we tell them, please don't put things in slash user. <laughs> you can't. So, <laughs> um, uh, no ZFS boot environments. Score! Because they're lame. You don't need them, right? When, when you have, essentially, stateless uh, root, because you don't need it. No IPS. Boot. Because IPS is awful, and um, just no bullshit. So all the things that like took like Solaris 10 was awesome, and, and Solaris uh, was awesome up until 121, and then it all became suckage. Um, so we're back, um, which leads us into the next thing, which is sparse zones of revenge. <laughs> zones were amazing. They were created. They were given to us on high from God. Apparently, a bunch of people at Sun were commissioned by him in order to build this because sparse <laughs> zones are awesome. Um, except other people were like, no, we need it to look like a real Solaris instance with boot environments and patching and, you know, all the sucky stuff you do in Solaris? We should let people in zones do that, too. I wasn't real cool with that, particularly because at Joint we built a huge business on sparse zones. So when they went away, not so happy. Um, sparse zones are awesome. Super lightweight virtualization, no patching, no BEs, uh, boot environments, ZFS boot environments. Uh, Reliable and lightning fast cloning because there's like no disk to move and you just clone off of a, a, a ZFS clone, a snapshot. They're simple, simple, simple. And uh, in SmartOS, they are branded joint. Okay, not sparse. The other side is that, that slur zones are awesome, but they don't solve all problems. Um, we understand that. And so KVM gives us the power. Once upon a time, we were using uh, XVM. I was using Zen because somebody at Sun thought that was an awesome idea, and I tried it, and it made me cry. And now <laughs> Brian came, saved the day, and now I'm happy. And I use KVM, and it's awesome. Um, containerization via zones. So we have all the power of KVM inside a zone. So we're not thinking in two completely different ways. A, a sparse zone uh, that, that we normally use, what we in the JPC call smart machines, has is a zone with a full user land environment and all your processes running. Uh, KVM ran, uh, uh, runs inside of a zone where there is no user land and it's just a KEMU process and a couple of logs. Um, we get a lot of things that come along with zones like rich resource controls, we get ZFS, we get crossbow, we get dtrace, powerful observation. Um, 
I've recently started doing a lot more with Linux, and I keep remembering that like core dumps are actually awesome. MDB is sort of awesome because when the system panics, it's nice to know why. Um, we get BSM and RBAC if you're into that sort of thing, which I am. And we get all these advantages of Solaris, which is the best operating system on planet Earth, in KVM. And we do all that all in our own specific way, it's smart OS. So we're not doing it in a big hodgepodge way like we had once upon a time. Um, and I will augment one thing that Brian had said earlier. He said that, that the OS matters. In, in operations at Giant, I've always felt that in the modern world, due to virtualization and what we use it, the OS matters because the OS doesn't matter. At the end of the day, in a modern environment, your operating system needs to do everything you need it to do so it can get the hell out of the way and let your virtualized environments run and do what they need to do. And it's, it's, it's incredible that it requires a lot of technology in order to make that happen and just fade in the background. Crossbow is a huge part of that. ZFS is a huge part of that. Um, Dtrace just makes it all the more awesome. All those resource controls take a lot of that off our plate. So um, we have two tools. These are the two tools. If there's two things you know about SmartOS, these are the two tools you need to know. They're abstraction tool set uh, for, for unified management of zones and KVM instances. We use one, two tools that do both. Okay. Um, the days of messing around with, with, with uh, zone ADM and zone CFG, all that fades away. You can use them, they're there, don't recommend it. These tools do it all for you. Um, we have the VM, ADM, VM administration tool. You can create, start, stop, modify, works with both zones and KVM. And then we also have a separate tool called image admin, which does, uh, uh, manages all your VM images. We have a, a public site where you can download VM images to get started with. Um, and uh, you can create your own data set servers and all kinds of cool stuff. All right, so thinking smart OS, this is where we get kind of into the workflows. Um, so this whole non-persistent environment is really cool, but it does change the way that you think about things. You can't just splat something on the root disk and it just expect that it be there. Um, so we have to think a little differently about how we do some things, so let's look at how we do workflow. So these are my, uh, your talk was cool, but the beer was better uh, slide. These are the things to walk away. Basic configuration is on the Z pool in this slash USB key slash config. Okay, that's your basic configuration. Um, there's very little in it, just networking, DNS, and NTP. That's it. You can't even set your, ho your, your host name in there. There's very little there. Um, also in this USB key configuration uh, is a, is a mock shadow file that includes the the crypto, the uh, it's MD5 or CHA uh, uh, root password um, that, that's default as well as uh, the SSH configuration. That's about it. MT is non-persistent. So if you have like, if you're going to use like say Nagios or something and you're used to having a slash etc slash Nagios, not going to happen. Um, op and var are. And of course we have the rest of the Z pool to create any kind of thing we want. So that's where we sort of want to get creative, right, as to where we put things. If things need to go in Etsy and the subdirectory, then maybe that needs to go in ZFS and be mounted on top later, or we can do things uh, in a different way. At boot, manifests that are found in slash opt-in slash opt slash custom slash SMF are loaded. So this is your hook to making things happen at boot time. Um, this is, of course, persistent. So uh, put everything that you want to go in there. So any kind of customization that needs to be performed at boot. Um, how many of you are using configuration management? Okay, hands down. Chef users? I love you. Put your hands down. Uh, puppet users? We'll train you. <laughs> CF engine and users? Oh, you hate yourselves. <laughs> I like all those guys. I'm friends with all of them, so I shouldn't say it because it's being recorded, right? So I shouldn't have just said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I use Chef. Uh, everything in the in the joint public cloud is is run via Chef. I Chef fits, I think, a very good model. It works really well. The interesting thing about this whole non-persistence thing is, for a lot of us, you're thinking like, yeah, you know, configuration management is important. I should really get around to that. It's probably something I should do, but. All these systems are already running and you know, whatever, I'll get around it one day. 
Well, now you have a system that essentially is rebuilt every time it boots. And you're thinking like, I've been meaning to do that anyway, now seems like a real good time. <laughs> um, that's essentially what happened. In JPC1, I had this monstrous uh, uh, post-install setup in my Jumpstart server. It was the most awesome ever, and I almost wrote a book about it because it was so awesome. Um, and the funny thing is, is of course, everyone spent months, years, working on this awesome Jumpstart infrastructure. We all had it, right? We were all very proud of it. Mine even had like uh, uh, brand names for it. It was that cool. Um, but it was ridiculous. It was insane. And I thought it, when, when Chef came along uh, and Pup and all that, I was like, I'm, I need to switch over to that. But switching over was an arduous, horrible thing. Um, it wasn't until this came along that I'm like, booyah, doing this right from the start. Um, and been very glad that I did it. Um, last two things on this slide uh, is what I mentioned before, VM admin and image admin. Those are the tools you need to know. If you come over to SmartOS, you boot it up, and you don't know about VM admin and image admin, you're gonna spin your wheels for a while trying to figure out what you're gonna do with this thing, okay? And uh, if you don't love JSON, start. Then where's the documentation? Uh, SmartOS.org or the man page. Yeah, man, VM ADM, man, image ADM. Yes. Yeah, it, 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 these are like real Unix guys we have working here who actually know, understand, and use man pages. And I'm very thankful for it. And, and they're updated. They're updated. <laughs> <laughs> they're, uh, um, I wouldn't go through the hair there. Now, I will go one step further. The, the man pages are fantastic. The, the, the documentation on the website, eh, we're getting there. Um, um, I'm going to be spending a lot of time actually in the next two weeks improving it because uh, it can be better. You don't um, off the HTML converter. Right. But one of the interesting things is both those tools are written in Node, which is JavaScript, which is simple. So you can actually just go and read the code without knowing JavaScript or any of that stuff. It's very, very straightforward, and, and it's amazing how much you can rock out of code pretty quickly, actually. So, okay, so let's talk about some basic workflows. First, uh, first and foremost is the installation uh, from USB workflow. So you're gonna download the USB image, you're going to DD it onto a USB key. You need a USB key that's two, two gigs or bigger. That's all right. right. Um, I normally use eight. You can buy them in huge packs at Costco. It's awesome. They also have a, a, a very cheap alcohol that you can pick up while you're there. <laughs> <laughs> it helps the install go. <laughs> Once you've done that, you've now got this USB key. You're going to insert your key, and you're going to boot. That's something you've probably done a lot of. You want to make sure that you do have a system with Intel VT extensions. Right? You probably do. Um, this one thing here just means that you are not going to be able to do what you did with Linux when it came out was cool. You cannot take the 46 piece of crap in the closet and boot it up and be like, I mean, it totally sucks. Yes? Quick question. Does that mean it won't work on an IMV chip? Or is it so not going to answer that question. So Out of bounds. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, the requiring VT, the VT extensions are specifically for KVM and running it works just fine on AMD. There's no KVM support on AMD. Okay. Good point. Good point. Yeah. If you, any 64-bit chip will run SmartOS. Okay. It will not. Not all 64-bit chips will run KVM. And Smart what? Yeah. And SmartOS without KVM is not as exciting. Yes. Smart's <laughs> a uh, 64-bit chip. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Do you want us to repent now or afterwards? <laughs> Spark was cool, now it sucks. We're all sad together. <laughs> Is that haiku? Yes. I, I think so. <laughs> if, you, if you walk around the office, you will find SS20s and Ultra 5s in this office right now, okay? In production. So. <laughs> um, so, once you do that, you're gonna put it in, you're gonna boot. You're gonna go, it's gonna pop up a little, very simple installer. It's gonna ask you a handful of very simple questions. Um, it's basically gonna ask you to create, uh, specify the information for your admin network. Uh, that's gonna be your default network. Um, you're gonna create the Z pool. It's gonna, it's gonna say, I see these disks. Which do you wanna use to create the Z pool? Uh, once you confirm that, uh, it's gonna ask you for a root password. That's it. The, that's it, it's done. Once that's done, it's gonna store that in slash USB slash config, and you're never gonna go through it again. Okay. And that includes uh, VLAN tagging for your networks? Yes, okay. that is part of, of, of the network information. Uh, so, okay, so once we've done that, the system's gonna reboot, come back up. Once it comes up, then you wanna go into opt custom, add any of your tooling 
if you so choose. Obviously, the first time you use it, you're not gonna have anything to do, but if you go into production. Um, for me, I have tons of tools that go in here. My monitoring system, I use Abix. Um, I've got a lot of the custom tools, LLDP tools that go in there for discovery network ports and all kinds of stuff like that. You're gonna wanna add those in there. Um, and in my case, I, I do everything through Chef. So the only SMS service that I run in off custom SMS is Chef. It fires Chef, and Chef does everything else. Um, and then once you've done that, it's time to play. So you're gonna go and download some images, and you're gonna start provisioning, okay? So to download images, we're gonna use that image ADM, IMG ADM update is the first command we're gonna run. That's going to go out to datasets.joint.com slash datasets and pull the current list of datasets, okay? One, that's sort of like doing a RPM update or whatever. You're just resyncing to the server to see what's available. Once you've done that, it's gonna say it's done, and then you're gonna run image admin avail. That's gonna show you all the data sets that are available. This is a very short list, but you can see some of these here, and they suspiciously look very much like the ones that we use in the joint public cloud, like MongoDB, Standard64, Base64, Base, going all the way down, React, put all kinds of stuff in there. Um, these are uh, both zones and VMs, both together. Okay. So, what are you gonna do now? So you've, you've updated, you've looked around at the list of available images that you can get. Now you're gonna go ahead and import one. So if we're gonna work with zones, we'll talk about zones first. What you're gonna do is you're gonna import one of those images, okay? If you want an image that has nothing, you're gonna use base, okay? Uh, there's a base and a base 64, that's just whether the user land is 64 bit or 32 bit. Um, Here's an important thing to note, and this is why I say if you just treat it like it's Solaris of old and start playing around with zone CFG and, and all this, you're gonna get very frustrated because you're not gonna be able to create a zone without a template. Um, once upon a time when you wanted to create a zone, you created a zone configuration and you run uh, zone ADM install, and it would copy over a bunch of things from, from the global zone into the zone and up and away you go. You cannot do that. Which means that if you do not have a template, you're going nowhere. And that's why I say if you don't know about this, you're just gonna be beating yourself in the head trying to figure out why in the hell it needs this template and what the hell is this template thing anyway. Um, the template is the image, okay? So you're gonna get that image. Um, once you've done that, we're gonna write a JSON description that describes the zone, and you're gonna create the zone. So it really looks like this. Image ADM avail. I'm gonna look for one of those base images that I said, because I wanna start with something clean that I can build on myself. So I'm gonna grab for base. And I'm gonna see these four base images. I got base 64, base and base 64. I'm gonna use the newest version, 171, okay? I'm gonna take this big, long, honking piece of crap, otherwise known as a UUID. I'm gonna take that UUID and I'm gonna import it, okay? Then it's gonna go and see, does it exist? No, it doesn't exist, I'm gonna start installing it. It's gonna take a little bit, a couple minutes, it's gonna download that image across the net, and it's going to have installed it. What that actually did is it took a ZFS snapshot off the dataset server, copied it to your local machine, and then received it to your local ZPool, okay? So now, you can clone it. So everything from here is quick. Is there any progress bar on that? <coughs> no, there is not. Patch is <laughs> um, Give me one Progress bars are not for server operations. Go to the other terminal and go and PSEF and look for the ZFS receive, okay? You're gonna see that running and you'll see the data set that it's receiving to. Then run ZFS get use, the use property, and that data set name, and you'll see how much is actually used. If you, are, if you have an idea how big that thing is, you're gonna be able to just hit that again and again and again and watch it grow, okay? Marcus bar. <laughs> yeah. Now, to be, to be fair, for most of, our Im most of our images are very small, we keep them very compact. I only mention that because I was working with a customer today where we had an image that was literally 100 gigs. So we're sitting there and, and it was one of those like, do we go to lunch or wait? So, so that was like, get used, get used, get used. Like actually, you know, get used, sleep 60, get used, and then pull the calculator and be like, no, 15 minutes, we'll just go to that. Yeah. Together? <laughs> Burn! <laughs> Are we good? Yeah. Okay. So now we've now we've imported this using our UUID. 
Get used to UUIDs, you're gonna use them a lot. Um, now the next thing we need to do is create that, that JSON description, okay? Um, you're gonna feed that JSON to VM ADM create, okay? You can either use dash F and a JSON file or you can just pipe the standard in. So in this case, I'm just because I need to keep it all one slide, I did it this way. The minimum things that you're gonna to need to specify here um, is the brand and the image UUID. And I always add an alias because when you write, if you use the, the, the zone ADM list command, you'll just see the UUID and an alias if you set it. If you don't set the alias, you're gonna be like, which one was that? <laughs> so, so set that. So this is gonna create a very boring zone. It's got no network, it's going from no, no nothing, okay? But it created it. Once you, once you run that, it's gonna have successfully created and immediately I can Z-log into it and there's my smart machine. This way. Where's the alias in relation to the UUIDs and the zone? It's almost an existential question. Um, <laughs> what I mean is, can you specify an alias per UUID like the image, or does it have to be associated with zone only? Like Each the, zone is represented by a UUID, yeah. which is why I'm struggling a little bit. Okay, so the, the, the alias in there is just a nice name that you can use with VMADM. Yeah. Okay. Is it like you can yeah. use, it's not, it's not unique, it's not enforced to be unique, it's just a nice name for your own sanity. Yeah, yeah, so in, in this case, I actually noticed this. The alias is zone ADM, uh, sorry, zone on one. Um, you notice down here my host name is the UUID. That's because I did not specify a host name uh, uh, parameter in my JSON. If I had done that, then that would have said that. So there are two names you're commonly going to give your, your zones or VMs. You're going to give it an alias. That's the one you're going to see in the global zone as the administrator. And then host name, which is actually going to be fed into into the zone of the VM, okay? This, so, yes sir? Is this not having a network uh, function of the base not having it or something? No, 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 that's me trying to fit it on the slide. Got it. That, is, that is all it is. You could configure it and then it would have it and go Oh yes, okay, yes, yes, but it would have either gone off the slide or maybe go one and you saw I got right to the bottom. It's just super awesome. So I wanted to just keep it at that. It, Man, VMADM for lots and lots of examples. Yes, so the, and that's one of the things. It has all all the parameters that are available. Uh, you can see them there. And because of the fact that, like I said, we have our esteemed people from Sun, you recall one of the things that people at Sun understood is is that the thing that you read in a man page is examples at the bottom. <laughs> you don't read all the crap at the top. You read the examples at the bottom. Um, <laughs> yeah, because I, I guess Linux people they all have internet connections that can use Google to search these things. But us, you know, old school Unix folks are all just like just read the man page and see the example. Um, every time I use Linux, I go to the man page. I immediately go to the bottom. And I'm like, dad, dad. <laughs> I have to like read. Um, okay, so KVM workflow. So you to be the exact same workflow. Now this is one thing that's very, very important. Um, like if you ever did use Zen on Solaris, which was branded XVM, it was entirely different than zones. Two completely different beasts. You could know one and have no idea how the other one functioned. Um, in this case, KVM and zones live in harmony under one tool chain. It's all managed the same, which has tremendous advantages. This is also one of the things that you're not going to pick up if you go over to OmniOS or any of the other Alumos distributions that end up having KVM. They have Kimu and they have all that, but they don't have the tools that yield by it, right? So if you want that kind of really nice, polished, targeted uh, feel that you get from from a, from, a, from a distro, you're going to get that with SmartOS, not others. So when we do K, when we do KVM, we're going to do it just like a zone, um, but with two options. Um, we have two options here because we actually can create it from nothing. So we can create an empty instance and then boot it from an ISO. A lot of times that's what you're going to want to do for fresh install. Or you can go to our nifty handy dandy image server and just download the latest Ubuntu or whatever you want. Right? Obviously we all know the trade-offs of getting somebody else's versus doing your own. I will say that when we do create images, we try to keep it as vanilla as possible. We're not trying to, you know, customize it or anything like that. We want to just save you the trouble of having to install it without inflicting our opinions on you. Um, now like we talked about before, Kimu runs inside uh, a minimal zone. Um, there's really nothing in there. You can't uh, Z-log into that zone. There's there's not shells and all those things. Um, but what you are going to want to do from time to time if you have a problem booting um, is 
And then this is on the Z pool, right? Slash zones, slash the UUID of the VM, slash root, slash temp. Okay. In there, you're going to find a VM.log and a start VM.log. So if you go and start a VM and you think it should be up and running, it's, it's like it's not pinging or something like that, you run VM ADM list and you see it's not in a running state, you're, wanna, you're going to want to go to that directory and see why it didn't start. A lot of times that'll be like if you have an image that's had a problem or something, it's just like crashing on boot or something like that. So ZFS and VMs, one other thing I want to mention about the, uh, the difference between zones and VMs in terms of how it's going to look on ZFS is that with a zone, you're going to have this zones, that's our pool, slash the UUID, okay? And that's all you're going to have is just this, and that's, that's your zone. When you do a VM, you're actually going to have three, right? We're going to have UUID, and this is just going to be 10 gigs, because basically all that's going to live there is the logs, right? Um, and then this disk zero, that's actually your file system disk for that, that's actually connected to your VM as, as the root disk, okay? So this is what we're installing into. Um, so you can see this one here is 101 gigs, okay? So disk zero. This also means that if you create a, if you create a KVM instance and then you want to snapshot it and send it off as a backup, um, or if you want to create your own image, what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to customize your your VM, then you're going to snapshot this disk zero, and send that to a file as, as a dump. That that's going to be your image. Okay. So of these three file systems, this one dash disk zero is the one you care about. If you have multiple disks, you're going to have disk zero, one, two, three, four. Okay. And you can see the all the other ZFS file systems we have here. Um, and you can see how these chunk here ADE these. 669, these, 058, these, map to these. So I need list. You can see these are VMs, two gigs, they're running, and these are my aliases. Yes? So if an image is describing the song that's running, can you run the same image twice and wouldn't have the same UUID? Yes! No, no it's going to have different UUIDs. So, right. great question. Let's talk about images right now. So creating an image. Um, an image is nothing more than a ZFS snapshot and a DS manifest JSON file. Okay, it's the data and a little bit of metadata. Um, for KVM instances and snapshots, like we just talked about, it's going to be this disk zero. For zones, it's just going to be the UUID. And the way that you're actually going to, to to turn this into an image is you're going to snapshot it, ZFS snapshot. Data set name, app, some name. You're then going to dump that, ZFS send that snapshot name, pipe it to a file, and then you're going to compress it with either GZ or BZ2. You must compress it. Um, my rec I love BZ2. BZ2 is awesome, except that it's really freaking slow with gigantic files. So I recommend GZ. Um, it's not as tight, um, but it's a hell of a lot faster. Um, so, so in order to create that, we're going to do this, okay? Now the thing that we need to supplement that with is metadata. What the hell is this blob of binary crap that we just made? Um, so we're going to create a DS manifest that's going to describe the disk image. It's going to have the size of, of the disk image. It's going to have a name associated with the disk image. It's also going to have a SHA-1 hash associated with that image. Get that right or life will suck. Um, and we have a couple other pieces of metadata that I won't belabor here, you'll, you'll see in the documentation. Uh, it's going to have a UUID uniquely describing that image. That UUID applies to the image, not the, not the instances you're going to create of it. Okay? We use UUIDs everywhere. Uh, it's got a name, it's got this thing called a URN, uh, which describes it. Um, you'll find things about that in the wiki, creator, creation date, etc. And then finally, once you have that image, um, to complete the life cycle, you want to take this image that you've created and customized and put love into, and you're going to want to put it up on a server so you can use it elsewhere. The way you're going to do that is uh, to either do it yourself. Um, the way that the server actually functions is really simple. You get a get slash, and you get all these JSON blobs that come out of your DS manifests. And then it's going to try and download those files from 
slash UUID slash whatever the disk name is, and you can just kind of hack your own up. Um, I do this uh, on Cuddletech by taking all the DS manifests and caddying them into index.html of a man uh, image direct uh, directory, and it totally works. Curl doesn't know the difference. Uh, or, if you want to want to be nifty, um, fantastic gentleman wrote a uh, node-based image server, which uh, you can get here, fire it up, and it runs. Huh? He was just on the stream until five minutes ago. Oh, we love him. And he's gone. Um, so, so that's available. Alternatively, this company called Joint makes this fantastic product called SUC, Smart Data Center, which does all this for you. Um, so last thing, every two weeks, we're getting releases. So go get them, smartOS.org. That's it. You can still go on one of your little introduction programs. Uh, sorry, what introduction program? Are you talking about the STC yeah, uh, whatever the program? program? Uh, I don't know. Yes. Is it? Yeah. Yes. So yeah, the, the yes. Speak to to Laurel. Yeah, yes. Laurel can can hook you up. Um, so Laurel, Laurel, if you got a question about adoption, STC, the STC adoption program. So so catch up with Laurel, and Laurel will be happy to help you out in terms of smart data center, not smart OS. SmartOS is available, it's all open source, available, download smartOS.org. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about Smart Data Center, and yes, so Laurel can, can hook you up with the adoption program. And, yeah, well, and smart, smart Data Center, just uh, not, not to, to over overhype it because we're talking about <coughs> SmartOS, but um, with, with SmartOS, like uh, with, with SDC, like you don't mess around with JSON, it's all handled in code. Um, you plug a USB key into one machine, it comes up as your head node, and then literally hundreds to thousands of machines in your data center all net boot. And you can have like a data center up and running in like literally minutes. And I'm not bullshitting you. I actually have to do these deployments. So if I, they would, other people might lie to you, but I would tell you the truth because I, I, I have to do in foreign countries. It's, it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a curiosity, was your hatred of uh, boot environments born out of live upgrade? I know mine was. Oh, he's on me. <laughs> That's a beer drink. That is, that, is, that, that, that is a beer drink. <laughs> Omni OS. Boot environments. Uh, Omni OS has boot environments. So if you want to rock it old school, and they work. Yeah, well, go he, with he, he, he was always pretty friendly as far as I can tell, but live upgrade was hell. Live upgrade sucks. Oh, so Brian, I think we're going to pull the chairs into a circle later and have a little support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just to do something a little fun because you can't do this very often. Brian, can you stand up? Sure. Thank you for smart OS, sir. I, uh, well, I, I thank right. everyone for smart OS. I don't know you see that. Come on. <laughs> thank you for Omni OS. <laughs> Nick Synth is not here. They're down there. One representative. Oh, stand up. Thank you for oh. Nick Santa. Hey, and there's another one. So, oh, which one do you have? And it's Nick Santa. And Nick Santa. Okay. But, I mean, isn't it in incredibly cool that, that, that there's so much amazing power in Solaris and, 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 and that that community, even though it was tried to be choked, is living on in new, unique, powerful tools. And I think Solaris is stronger than it's ever been. Um, it looks a little different than it did. It's called the Lumos now. We're it's living on the, the SVC. <laughs> I'm not going to change the name for We're example. living on the asphyxiation high. We are. But it, it is cool. Woo! <laughs> 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 Hello, Lonnie. Never knew how good it could be. <laughs> Anything? <laughs> One more question? I think you partially answered it. I was going to ask. If you have to boot every box that you have off the USB key, how do you do updates to, to that USB stick? I mean, that, that this is the important thing I want to remember. This is, this is something we talked about outside. This isn't like a live CD or something where you're running your operating system on the USB key, okay. right? Because that's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> we don't do that. Um, it is purely a medium for booting uh, 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 the, the images into memory. And at that point, like once you boot a SmartOS, you can pull that thing out. To answer the question, you can pixie boot the images. Um, Smart Data Center handles right. that for you. But you, right. you, 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 all you need is one. All you need is one. And then after, yeah, right. After so, that. so in that case, okay. you, you put the USB key in. It brings up the head node. So it's, it's all based right. on Smart OS. No, once that it, it, it unfolds everything, and then once it does that, everything else um, USB uh, pixie boots, not on the USB key. Um, the only difference really uh, there between the way USB keys are used in, in SDC versus Smart OS is there is synchronization of configuration state of the, the, the smart data center head node onto the USB key that you don't have in smart. Yes. Right. How do you do your network segregation between the... I said one more question, and that's a big one, so I'm going to avoid it. Robert, <laughs> <laughs> Robert, 
Do you want to introduce Robert? Yeah, I'll introduce Robert. I mean, the answer, the, 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 there is actually an answer to that question. Ben is not there, No, I'm not snowing you. I'm just, I like, this is a super awesome time. Yeah, so, um, so uh, I'm, I, Robert, I, again, another backpack I have not yet vomited in. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, um, Robert I, I, I also was one of a, a, us at Fishworks at, at